Hello friends, welcome to class. This is Eat, Read, Sleep 101, a course on vibing with books. On the syllabus for today is the summary for the book Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari. My name is Kalina and I'm the TA for Professor T who should be here by now. He's usually rarely ever like Thanks for waiting class. Thank you. Here you What is this? You can get a real one? Uh, it was all I had. I took it from my daughter's room. Sorry. I'm Professor T and this is Eat, Read, Sleep 101. You went to that too? Okay. Today we're summarizing Sapiens, a okay. brief history. You said that too? Okay. All right, well, let's just get started then. Class, are you ready to tackle the biggest questions of history and the modern world? Are you ready to ask yourself, what does it mean to be human? I suggest you start getting notes. 13.8 billion years ago, the first atoms and molecules appeared. This was the beginning of chemistry. 4.5 billion years ago, Earth was formed. 2.5 million years ago, the first humans evolved in Africa. 2 million years ago, humans spread from Africa to Eurasia. This was the evolution of different human species. 300,000 years ago, the first fire was lit. 200,000 years ago, Homo sapiens evolved in East Africa. Up until this point, humans existed but had no influence to history, no impact to the environment, and were no more significant than jellyfish or fireflies. Up until this point, it was considered prehistoric. Then began the three important revolutions that shaped the course of history. The Cognitive Revolution, which started 70,000 years ago. This was when Homo sapiens developed cognitive abilities that surpassed other humans of the time. This is when cultures started to form. Then came the agricultural revolution, 12,000 years ago. This brought the domestication of plants and animals. And finally, the third revolution, the scientific revolution, which got underway only 500 years ago. This is the era of exploration, science, capitalism, and what makes up our modern day societies. Okay. Thank you for that, Kalina. Thank you. Have a seat. There's a debate that's disturbing to many. According to Harari, we are the members of the great apes family. Our nearest living relatives are in fact the chimpanzees, the gorillas, and orangutans. Furthermore, we're not the only humans in history. The term humans is inclusive of all species such as Homo rudolfensis, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, and the Homo sapiens, or sapiens, which means wise humans. For more than two million years, multiple human species roamed Earth together at the same time. During this time, humankind was in the middle of the food chain. It's important to note that for animals getting to the top of the food chain, it's a gradual move. It takes over millions of years. But humans, humans left to the top of the food chain within 300,000 years. Look at me, short. I'm the captain now. They sped up this process with the use of fire. Whereas chimps spend five hours a day chewing raw food, humans were able to cook and eat raw food in one hour. This evolved their intestines, decreased energy consumption, and evolved a larger brain size. However, this is the problem because the rest of the food chain wasn't ready for this change. And frankly, neither were we. This is why we feel anxious and stressed. It is unnatural for us to be in an ecosystem that has not biologically advanced at the same rate that we have conquered it. It's also the reason why we pig out on fatty foods. This instinct is wired into our DNA as a survival mechanism when foragers had to eat what they could, otherwise they didn't eat for days. Or the reason that I do it. I, I mean, we do it. Another reason why sapiens advanced so quickly was their ability to communicate, but not just in terms of talking. Sapiens used language and gossip to unite strangers and created relationships, trust, and belief in imaginary ideas. The cognitive revolution brought on the cognition of myths, religion, fantasy, collective beliefs, and something that had never happened before, cooperation in large numbers. Chimps, for example, can't form a group of more than 50. Humans, on the other hand, 
can form groups of more than 150 humans. In human groups larger than 150, gossip and personal communication isn't enough to maintain order. But through telling stories, common myths and beliefs can create a reality. Collaboration and cooperation can sustain groups much larger than 150. Take things like money. Money is the most powerful shared fiction. Dollar bills are meaningless without the shared belief that they have value. It is this common belief that unites nearly the entire world we live in. An LLC or a brand doesn't actually exist in the physical world. Yeah! You could kill the owners or founders of an LLC or a brand and it would still exist because the myth of the brand has the power to move humans to continue to produce and consume under a name that has no physical life. Thank you. It's a shared belief that brings about culture, peace, and society as we see it today. And because myths are not genetically based, sapiens could adapt and change their behavior as soon as they adapted a new belief. This is why they didn't have to wait millions of years to get to the top of the food chain. With this, Homo sapiens were able to cooperate, organize at scale, and dominate over the other species who lacked cognitive awareness, leaving sapiens to rule the world as the sole human species for 13,000 years. Thank you. It's important to know that there are two theories regarding a sapien takeover. Interbreeding theory suggests that sapiens bred with other human populations and people today are the outcomes of this interbreeding and the replacement theory in which sapiens could not breed with the other humans and kill them off, either directly by force or indirectly through competition of resources. In addition, Harari indicates that there is no coincidence that at the same time as sapiens entered the picture, so did the extinction of half of the planet's large animal species. Can we continue at this progressive rate and avoid the next wave of animal extinction? Save the whales! Save the whales! This is the essence of the agriculture revolution, the ability to keep people alive under worse conditions, Harari says. It is incredible that the agriculture revolution sprang up independently in many different parts of the world. The significance of the time is that it allowed humans to collect more food per territory. This led to an exponential growth in the human population. Yeah. 10,000 years ago, sapiens started to actively manipulate plants. And instead of foraging as they used to, they started to cultivate and farm plants, specifically wheat and grains, not this one. This gave them the advantage of food security, permanent camps, and exponential reproduction. Unfortunately, less foraging led to many undesirable outcomes, things like more labor, more work was required to cultivate these crops. And then there was an increase in human violence to compete for land and less variety in their diet that meant a really weakened immune system, like, oh, I get sick over everything, and infectious diseases that just spread among all these concentrated camps and, and the villagers and settlements, and there was an increased rate of childhood mortality in smaller children that relied on grain rather than breast milk. This became the luxury trap in which luxury like excess grains becomes a necessity and then brings it added obligation like cultivating and storing grain. The agricultural revolution was a lesson of discrepancy between evolutionary success and individual suffering. The effects of agricultural revolution brought about many developments. The hierarchy system started in which those deemed as peasants spent their time in the fields laboring. Transportation technology connected a network of kingdoms and cities, and significantly important, very important, another imaginary concept became critical at this time. While foragers didn't have to think about the future because they lived hand in mouth and did not have time to carry out anxieties and anything but the present moment, the concept of the future became necessary during this revolution. In order to predict the weather forecasts and food storage patterns, worrying about the future became a major player in the human mind. Indeed, the stress of farming was the foundation of large-scale and political and social systems that formed during the agricultural revolution. Let's take a look at something called the imagined order. Belief in a type of order does not mean that it has to be true. So as long as it allows cooperation and leads to better society, people tend to believe. Examples of imagined orders that carry on to this day are Christianity, democracy, capitalism, 
consumerism, and romanticism. During this time, the evolution of us versus them division transcended to the ability to foresee the potential unity of humankind. Enter money, the greatest global conqueror of all. Go ahead, Gal. Okay, so prior to the agricultural revolution, hunters and gatherers, they had no need for money. They shared goods and they shared services through an economy of favors and obligations. Hey. But the rise of cities and kingdoms and transportation infrastructures, all of this led to complex societies with a demand for money. Now, money doesn't have to be dollar dollar bills. It's, it's just anything that people are willing to use in order to have a system of value in order to exchange goods and services. Back then, cowrie shells were used as money. And in modern times now, like in prisons, cigarettes can be used as money. To give you a visual of how money is really just a belief, a figment of our imagination, let me break this down for you. Today, the total amount of money in the world is about 60 trillion. Yet the sum of total coins and banknotes is less than 6 trillion. More than 90% of all money exists only on computer servers. Wait. It, is that right? I'm really bad at math. Okay, great. Now, how does money actually work? I just said that it's a figment of our imagination. So let me explain. Money is the most universal and most efficient system of mutual trust ever devised. That's a quote from you all. Dollar have value only in our common imagination and has no material reality. It's a psychological construct. The first type of money was barley because it was real and people could trust in its inherent biological value, but it was difficult to transport. The breakthrough was people's trust in something that was easier to store, easier to transport, but lacked inherent biological value. Say hello to the first coins that surfaced around 640 BC by King Lydia in Western Anatolia. It's important to note the price of money. Money can break down local traditions, intimate relations, and human values. Because although money builds universal trust between strangers, it's a trust invested in money itself and not the trust in humans, communities, or sacred values. Moving on from money, the agricultural revolution also brought about the universal and missionary religions as we see today, like Christianity and Buddhism. Prior to this, ancient religions were more local and exclusive. But what we are seeing in the last 300 years is a rise of secularism. Strong beliefs in ideologies like capitalism, communism, nationalism, or liberalism. So let's fast forward to the last 500 years, the scientific revolution. We've witnessed a phenomenal and unprecedented growth in human power. The population has grown 14 times the energy consumption has grown 115 times and the production has grown 240 times. What's significant about this revolution is that it was the first time humans as a whole admitted to being ignorant. They realized they didn't know everything in the world. Tell that to my ex. This is huge because prior to this, ancient traditions did not believe in progress and only admitted to two kinds of ignorance. Personal ignorance of something important like where did my foraging partner go with my bow and arrow? Or ignorance in a tradition where they are unaware of unimportant things. So what does this ignorance represent? It's the ability for humans to gain more knowledge and use it as power. And even though not everyone can understand things like quantum mechanics or cell biology, everyone benefits from the power that science gives us. And it's this new power from scientific discoveries that rallied people to believe in the idea of real progress being possible for all. This idea of progress convinced people to put more and more trust in the growth of the future. Hence the concept of credit. Credit enables us to build the present at the expense of the future. This assumption that our future resources are more abundant than our present resources. Thus the cycle we see, trust created credit, credit brought real economic growth. Growth strengthened the trust in the futures and this opened the way for even more credit. See that? When you take a look at capitalism, the creed is that the profits for production must be reinvested in increasing production. Capitalism has gradually become more than just an economic doctrine. It's an entire ethic, 
Instead of teaching about how often people should behave, educate children, and even think, capitalism's belief in the perpetual economic growth is behind almost everything we know about the universe. And we can't forget that science is very expensive. Science studies are funded usually because someone believes in the cause. Research can only flourish if there is a connection between some religion or ideology. Because it's this ideology that justifies cost of the research. So although it's the banks and the governments that print the money, it's the scientists that foot the bill and the ideology that determines the agenda. Earlier, I mentioned the increase of consumption. But while the human use of energy and raw materials has increased in the last few centuries, the amounts available for our exploitations have actually increased as well. What? Okay, so check this out. The steam engine was the first invention to convert heat into movement. That revolutionized transportation and turned petroleum into liquid political power. The ocean. Every few decades, we discover new energy source. More energy, more consumption, more consumption, more discovery of energy sources. Another thing that is wild today in the US is that only 2% of our population makes a living from agriculture. Yet this 2% makes enough food not only to feed the US population, but to also export surpluses out into the rest of the world. Although the future is unlikely to yield a lack of resources, Harari argues that we are very likely to destroy what remains of the natural habitat of this world and drive most other species to extinction. We must consider that continued destruction of the ecosystem may increase the frequency of human-induced natural disasters. Furthermore, when we look at the last two centuries, the pace of change has become so fast that the social order now exists in a state of permanent flux. Yeah, I can totally tell my kids Back in my day, the world was totally different. I mean, Instagram, check this out. They just updated their algorithm again last week. I'm like, what the heck is going on with the world? Jeez. The only thing in modern society that we can be certain of is the incessant change and the need for progress. So how does progress tie in with human chase for happiness? Put this one away. We hear all the time that power corrupts. And yeah, we can consider modern sapient accomplishments a success, but only if we completely ignore the fate of all the other animals and species that have died before us. We see more illnesses now than ever before, and we see suffering from alienation and meaningless materialism. Perhaps a loss of contentment in community, religion, and a bond with nature is what's preventing us from happiness. Scientifically, we know that people are made happy by pleasant and sensations in their bodies. Some people are happier than others naturally. So if we accept biological approach to happiness, then our history has no impact on our biochemistry to happiness. Harari argues that when we can finally realize that the keys to happiness are in the hands of our biochemical systems, we can stop wasting time on ideologies, politics, and social reforms, and shift our focus to what he thinks is the only thing that can make us happy, manipulating our biochemistry. It sounds a bit crazy, but it's not far-fetched, guys. Take notes. We see things that could be considered the end of homo sapiens. That's us. A replacement of natural selection by intelligent designs of biological engineering, cyborg engineering, and even engineering of inorganic life. I mean, we have genetics that hope to revive extinct animals. It's not possible. We have the Gilgamesh Project, where scientists and scholars believe that the investigation of physiology, hormones, and genetics, with that, we can defy disease and old age. And by the year 2050, some humans will even become amortal, like a really good night cream where you don't age at all. So the next stage of history is not only technological and organizational transformation, but also a fundamental transformation in human consciousness and identity. In essence, the cognitive revolution was a social development that enabled sapiens to migrate across the world and achieve biological domination. This is the point when history declared its independence from biology. The agricultural revolution was history's biggest fraud. It was the ability to keep people alive under worse conditions. And the scientific revolution was built upon man's willingness to admit his ignorance and is where we pondered today. When you look at the hindsight fallacy, the better you know about history, the harder it is to explain why things happen one way and not the other. History cannot be explained and it cannot be predicted because it's so chaotic. And unfortunately, history has shown to be unbeneficial to mankind 
and there is no proof that human well-being improves as history continues. That's it for class today guys. Time for a pop quiz for those in class and those at home. Question for you guys. Does progress make people happier? King Lydia in Western Anatolia. <laughs> no, I don't know how to flip a coin. <laughs> Okay, well, how do I flip the coin? Okay, flip it and walk off. I'll be, I'll just be like this. So I'll catch it. Is he perfect? Oh. Three, two. Three. <laughs> 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 how are you flipping? Let me see your hand motions. What do you do? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I flipped a coin. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Lydia in Western Anatolia. <laughs> <laughs>